I presented or I am presenting the report on women, peace and security and a resolution because we are celebrating the 20th anniversary of this resolution and we have thus been dealing with this topic within our parliamentary assembly. But before we begin, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to say a few words about the terrorist attack that took place in France this morning, which has shocked and deeply saddened us. After these terrible attacks of 2016, once again in Nice, a terrorist took the lives of innocent people. And I would like to say on behalf of our assembly that our thoughts are with the victims, with their families, and their friends. And what is particularly shocking about this news is that it's only two weeks ago that the teacher Samuel Paty was killed, brutally murdered, decapitated. And this goes to show that we will have to deal with this topic of growing terrorism in our countries, even more than in the past, because it shows that this is something that can affect us all. And we know that these attacks are attacks on our values, the values that we live for, the values that NATO stands for as a not just military alliance, but as a value-based alliance. On behalf of the members of the NATO PA, I would like to say that we are showing solidarity with France and with all our allies who join us in standing up against terrorism. And I'm convinced that the best way to fight terrorism is to uphold our values and to stand together and to act together. But now, let me get back to today's topic. I already mentioned that 20 years ago on Saturday, the UN Security Council adopted the groundbreaking resolution 1325. And it was groundbreaking because it was the first time that the Security Council recognized that parties to a conflict have the responsibility to prevent the violation of women's rights. And what I think is so important about this resolution is the fact that women are seen not just as victims, but that as a result of this resolution, they, or in this resolution for the first time, they were seen as active participants in peace and peace building. And that is why the resolution underlines the importance of integrating a gender perspective in all peacekeeping operations. And it urges us to ensure increased representation of women at all levels in our member states. For this reason, over the past 20 years, and particularly over the past 10 years, our assembly has worked towards making progress here. 10 years ago, our assembly adopted a resolution calling for the incorporation of this agenda in all NATO policies and practices. And the NATO Secretary General Special Representative has also been very much involved in this. And the position, her position was created as a result of these discussions with the NATO Secretary General. And that's why we believe this is so important too. We adopted measures to ensure a better gender equality in our assembly and one of our methods was a survey on how things are developing in our member states. We wanted to make an attempt to, well, put pressure on governments through parliaments in order to ensure better gender equality. And that is why we did launch quite a number of measures. And for this reason, I'm delighted to be able to introduce our panel today. It is a particular honor.
Now to welcome our friend Claire Hutchison with us here today. Claire, the Secretary General appointed you the NATO Secretary General's Special Representative for Women, Peace and Security in January 2018. And Claire, I'm sure that this anniversary year is a very busy year for you and that you've been working an awful lot. So we are all the more grateful that you have made it possible to be with us here today and we are delighted to have you with us. A very warm welcome and thanks for coming. I'm also delighted to introduce Vice Admiral Louise Dedican. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing it correctly. She has served as the Norwegian military representative to NATO since the beginning of 2020. Vice Admiral Dedican came to Brussels from the position of commandant of the Norwegian Defense University College, where she led the most comprehensive restructuring of Norwegian national military education in modern times. And last but not least, I am very pleased to welcome Christina Finch, head of the Gender and Security Division at DCAF. Ms. Finch is a human rights lawyer and an advocate. She has a long experience in the field, including at the OSCE's Office of Democratic Institutions and Human Rights and at Amnesty International USA. Ms. Finch, our assembly highly values our close cooperation with DCAF. It is a great pleasure to have you here with us today. Now, before we begin, I should note that the recording of this meeting will be published on our assembly website and our social media challenges. Right, and I would like to ask you all, when you speak, to speak clearly into your microphones, otherwise our interpreters won't be able to understand you well enough to interpret properly. So thank you very much, Claire. We will start with you. You have the floor. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much. Thank you, Ulla. Thank you uh, to the Parliamentary Assembly for this invitation. I am so delighted uh, to be here with you on the cusp of this anniversary uh, uh, this weekend. So good afternoon to all of you, gentle women and gentle men. And uh, as you will know, uh, this, uh, this anniversary has also come uh, last week. We had a defence ministerial where the topic of women, peace and security was on the agenda for the first time. So that is another NATO first, which we're delighted about. Um, and we had a North Atlantic Council meeting, again, where we talked about uh, the future of women, peace and security. So I think we are doing well pushing this bar higher and higher up. Uh, but we have lots more to do. So as you know, and as said, uh, we are here because on 31st of October in 2000, the United Nations Security Council unanimously adopted Resolution 1325. And it was a historic moment because for the very first time, women's experiences and roles in conflict were addressed as a matter of international peace and security. And 1325 is about, its essence is about, opening spaces and dislodging obstacles to women's participation in and around conflict and peace. And it, we know that sustainable peace cannot be achieved without women's security and equality. We know this and we've known this for a very long time. And we know that the treatment of women in any society is a barometer for predicting other forms of oppression. We know from early warning indicators this to be true. And we know that countries where women are empowered are vastly more secure. And so Resolution 1325 demonstrated that women can act as catalysts in the transformation of peace and they play a prominent role in the prevention and resolution of conflict and in the restoration of rule of law, governance and democracy. They serve as mediators of disputes. They hold families together in times of conflict. They identify and manage resources when there are very few, and we've seen this recently through COVID as well. And in many cases, they defend and protect, often at great personal risk. From the violence against women in Kandahar, the rape of women in Focha, 
the trafficking of women from Sinjar. Their bodies carry the scars of violence and the wounds of loss. But women are very resilient. And we've seen this resilience through the inter-ethnic women's bread march in Pristina, women bridging ethnic divides in the shelling of Sarajevo, and most recently, the bicycle riding activism of young women in Baghdad. So over the last 20 years, the women, peace and security agenda has expanded. It's expanded its scope and breadth. And we now have 10 Security Council resolutions that have given us more latitude to explore and, and, and for it to evolve over time. And this means that we can address emerging security challenges that are coming very fast to us. The Women, Peace and Security agenda and its relevance has also evolved for our NATO allies and partners. And in the early days, NATO recognized the value of deploying women to operations and missions, and this was the core, the center of our work. It helped with force protection and situational awareness for our troops and provided a foundation for increased recognition of gender parity as an operational enhancer. But 20 years later, we know that the efficacy of this mandate is not based on numbers alone, and we cannot let numbers be a surrogate for gender equality. To advance gender equality, we've learned we must be vigilant in promoting the integration of gender perspectives into all our functions. It's only when we weave gender through all of our core tasks and across all of our functions will we achieve the ultimate lasting goal of freedom and security. We've also learned through the years that women are not only agents for positive change, they can be perpetrators of violence and terrorism, sympathizers and enablers, mobilizers, and quite often extremely influential in forming social network networks that insurgents use for support, including in Afghanistan. We've learned much over the years and we've made notable progress. We've adopted and adapted and we've translated women, peace and security into our own vision, becoming a more capable alliance as a result. And we realize that our vision of security must be anchored to the inclusion of women in, in all of what we do, as well as the adoption of a gender perspective. But on this anniversary, I will not take the time to celebrate, but only to reflect, because I do believe we have not done enough and we have much, much more to do. And there are many challenges to overcome. For women, peace and security truly to be successful, it must have resonance. It must make the agenda fit for purpose and to ensure everybody understands how this is integral to our work. And that means we have to guarantee it becomes an element of all work on, con on conversations around cybersecurity and climate change and defense investment. And it must sit comfortably with all of the conversations we have, not just those conversations on women, peace and security. We also have to make sure that there are more women included in political decision-making. 20 years after the adoption of 1325, there are only 14 countries that have over 50% of women in its cabinet and four countries that have at least 50% in its legislative. We have to do more to increase numbers. But again, numbers are not the whole answer. And so the key to sustainable, meaningful progress is really about a change of mindset. And that is what integrating a gender perspective is about. The work to advance gender equality is all of our responsibility. It is a collective agenda to which allies and partners must be committed because will and conviction must be spoken and actions must follow that. As the most enduring political military alliance in the world, we have the opportunity to lead by example, to elevate women, peace and security as a political and operational tool, and to demonstrate not only our commitment, but our determination to make gender equality a reality. And this responsibility extends to our partners, as well as to civil society, and to everybody that works with us. But I also, and finally, want to stress the importance of sex disaggregated data. And this is the area that is most missing in the work that we do. 
and it's collectively becoming a global impediment to the implementation of women, peace and security. Whether we're looking at refugee flows or the makeup of workers in the sectors, uh, whether we're looking at uh, in our homeland or in a further afield, we must be able to use sex segregated data that will make us more resilient and make our communities more resilient. And access to this information is essential. And you can play a positive role in help us, helping us identify those gaps and challenges by regularly asking the question, how many women and men are impacted or involved? not only in everyday parliamentary assembly business, but in your national assemblies, in everything that you do. Because as we face new challenges, whether cyber, climate change, or disinformation, applying a gender lens and unpacking data will support more successful outcomes. We have much left to do, and we have to do this together. We've got to ensure that women, peace and security continues to enhance the work of this alliance and that the progress that has been made is sustainable, that it isn't just an anniversary bliss moment, but that it continues well into the future. Because as we forge a path past this anniversary, I know that NATO and the Parliamentary Assembly will do its part and we will continue to build on and strengthen the interpretation of women, peace and security well into the future. Thank you. Sorry, sorry. Thank you, Claire. Uh, Thank you very much, Claire. I would like to give the floor immediately to Louise. Louise, please. Sie müssen ihr yeah. Mikro. Yes. Just at the bottom of the screen, at the bottom of the screen, you should have a microphone. If not, I'll try, I'll try to activate it. Let's see. Yeah. Can you speak now? Let's see if that works. No. Can you send a message? Alexander? Did you, or did you, uh, yeah, I think you can hear us. Did you have uh, headphones, uh, Admiral? Maybe you can try with the headphones and see if that's. If that works, perhaps. But the microphone microphone is, is that, out. Yeah, the microphone. Is yeah. right? So we turn we turn the microphone on on our sides, uh, but she still needs to activate it on her side. And if if that doesn't work, uh, maybe try refreshing your page. Let's just see if I see a frozen image now. Yeah. <laughs> Louise, can you hear us? No. Let's see. Maybe she is refreshing. Yeah. 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 Okay. That will help. Leave and come back. Let's hope. Or, or should we change and... Uh Christine, maybe, yeah, maybe if you like, Ula, and then and then we can get the admiral back. Yes, Christina, right, once back. yeah, yeah. Can can you continue? Then we have a little bit time to to organize it with, uh, yeah, with Louise. Of course. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Perfect. <laughs> well, honorable members of the NATO Parliamentary Assembly, dear excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you so much for inviting me here to speak today about such a critical topic for regional and world security. As the Honorable Ella Schmidt said, I'm Christina Finch. I'm the head of the Gender and Security Division at the Geneva Center for Security Sector Governance, DCAF. DCAF is an organization with 63 member states that has over the last 20 years worked to support improvements in the security and justice sector in over 80 countries and every region of the world. We offer a global perspective on the successes and challenges of achieving the goals of the Women, Peace and Security Agenda, drawing from work directly with armed forces, parliaments and ministries and intergovernmental organizations, including NATO, 
the OSCE, and the UN. Today, I emphasize two lessons learned from our work. First, that achieving the goals of the Women, Peace, and Security Agenda requires changing the institutional culture in security and justice institutions. And second, that parliaments have a critical role to play in monitoring and guiding national progress towards these goals and more broadly towards achieving gender equality in the security sector. And I'm proud to say that DCAP has tools that can support parliaments in doing just that. Turning to my first point regarding changing the institutional culture, major international reviews and local civil society organizations alike express dissatisfaction at the slow pace of implementation of the Women, Peace, and Security agenda. Many point to government's failure to resource work on this agenda or create accountability for it. We see in many countries international human rights standards being eroded and political violence targeting women and sexist and homophobic speech by political leaders increasing. Security and justice sector institutions, including the armed forces, play a critical role in achieving the goals of the Women, Peace, and Security agenda precisely because we rely on them to protect women and girls from violence, to promote women's human rights, including women as personnel, and to facilitate gender responsive peace building. Over the last 20 years, many security and justice sector institutions, including NATO and armed forces, have introduced policies, guidance, training, and advisory positions to support gender mainstreaming. Many have increased their numbers of female staff. These measures have at times helped institutions become more inclusive and representative and to do their jobs better. But measures to recruit more women, address sexual harassment, improve responses to violence against women, implement gender training, et cetera, will all have little or limited impact unless attitudes and practices that exclude and devalue certain people and issues are changed. We see this when, as so often, gender policies are adopted but not implemented, when women are recruited but not promoted, when gender-based violence services are under-resourced, and when gender training is met with smirks. Discriminatory attitudes and practices are often unconscious or structural and hard to make visible. But this doesn't mean they can't be changed. And parliaments play a critical role in calling for this change. We see that success can be achieved when there is, first, a recognition by leadership that harassment and discrimination against women and other groups that are marginalized are serious problems and critically when a commitment is made by them to address the root causes. Second, when there's a willingness by leadership to make these problems visible by, for example, listening to staff and communities and undertaking regular collection and analysis of data. And third, the creation of strong mechanisms to monitor progress towards gender equality and broader diversity and inclusion. DCAF has been working with armed forces that are willing to proactively shine a light on their problems in their institutional culture. I'll speak today about two examples, Georgia and Ukraine. For the last three years, we've worked with the Georgian Armed Forces and Ministry of Defense to support a gender responsive organizational climate assessment. A big title, for a big review. It's a confidential, credible, scientifically robust study of how women and men in the armed forces experience their working environment, including any harassment or discrimination. This assessment has led to a range of measures to address challenges identified for women and men in different areas of military life, from women's perception of their career opportunities to their experiences of sexual harassment and the need for more training to address it. The assessment also provides reliable baseline data against, to, against which to monitor new initiatives, ensuring that the initiatives that are taken are effective or can be adapted if improvements are needed. 
In Ukraine, we are working with the national police, assisting them in conducting a gender self-assessment, which looks systematically at how the police meet the different needs of women and men in their communities, and whether there is discrimination or harassment. We're doing similar work with the National School of Judges and the Academy of Prosecutors to overcome institutional barriers and biases that undermine proper responses to violence against women. These type of processes are time consuming. They require technical skills, the commitment of resources, monitoring, and genuine accountability. But this is the serious work that's needed to make meaningful progress towards realizing the goals of the Women, Peace, and Security Agenda. Turning to my second point, the critical role of parliaments in achieving the Women, Peace, and Security Agenda. Parliaments can and must play a critical role in actively monitoring their nation's implementation of this agenda, including the development and implementation of national action plans. Parliamentary monitoring and oversight of the implementation of the commitments can be conducted through a variety of measures, such as using its legislative power to ensure that effective legislation exists, raising the issues in parliamentary debates, committee meetings, and hearings, creating cross-party working groups on women, peace, and security, publishing reports, and submitting hard questions to government officials. This assembly's 2018 survey on the implementation of women, peace, and security in NATO member countries, which DCAF helped to write, showed that all NATO parliaments are involved in some way with women, peace, and security. That's fantastic news. But the survey showed much more could be done by parliaments. Only 36% of NATO parliaments were using two or more monitoring mechanisms in overseeing the implementation of the Women, Peace, and Security agenda. In February, DCAF published a new resource for parliamentarians addressing this, and more holistically, the integration of a gender perspective in everything parliaments do. As part of DCAF's comprehensive gender and security toolkit, we published Tool 7 on parliamentary oversight of the security sector and gender, which focuses on providing practical suggestions for parliaments to take action to ensure the agenda is fulfilled. This tool looks at how parliaments can, first, security, ensure that security and security needs are defined in an inclusive manner and with a gender perspective. Second, that effective legislation and structures are in place to address gender-based violence. And third, that gender is mainstreamed into budgeting. As parliamentarians, you all know that budgets are a government statement of its priorities. Simply put, if there's no money to implement an agenda, it's highly unlikely that it will be. Fourth, that there's a robust cooperation between parliaments and civil society as well as ombuds institutions and national human rights institutions to incorporate gender mainstreaming into parliamentary work. And fifth, that parliaments demand, monitor, and oversee national action plans on women, peace, and security. Parliaments can be a driving force to achieve the women, peace, and security agenda. With myriad tools at their disposal and the political will to use them, Achieving transformational change is possible. We'd be happy to discuss more about these leverage points and the big picture in achieving the Women, Peace, and Security agenda in more detail with any interested parliament. And I look forward to a robust discussion on these issues. Thank you very much for your time. Yeah, vielen Dank. Thank you, Christina. And I hope that we now can hear Louise. You can hear me now? Yeah, that's good. Thank you so much. I'm very, very sorry for the technical yeah. issue. Uh, it was actually the whole um, internet connection that went down here for a second. And unfortunately, that was exactly when I was just about to speak. But nevertheless, thank you so much for the invitation and this uh, possibility to address this exclusive webinar. Uh, I feel um, 
simply very honored to speak to this distinguished group, uh, and I'm so happy to see you. Well, first, I would like to emphasize that women, peace and security agenda and gender perspective are as important to me personally as it is to the execution of my leadership as the Norwegian military representative to NATO. It's really, really close to my heart. Therefore, I would like to use this opportunity to look back on how gender perspectives have evolved in the Norwegian armed forces over the 20 past years, trying to understand what has been achieved in terms of actual effects. And when doing so, I have leaned on Dr. and Lieutenant Colonel Lena Kvarving, who has done extensive research in this field. Although her conclusions are specifically addressing Norwegian conditions, I think it is right to apply her findings with some minor moderation to any member of the alliance or partner nations. The conclusions in question constitute a comprehensive list of specific shortfalls, but also some successes. It is not all dark and gloomy. However, as far as I can see, the absence of efforts to mainstream gender perspectives as defined by the UN constitutes the core problem. To my understanding, we are not challenging ourselves nor our surroundings when it comes to gender mainstreaming. Instead, we have settled with a halfway solution where we are satisfied with the word gender appearing in a text or a military plan. I'd like to add, my colleagues have reported it as a tick in the box in that respect. Gents and ladies, that is just not good enough. For the sake of all the good work that has been done by our predecessors, we owe it to them to challenge ourselves and move a bit further. So, when looking back at Dr. Kvarving's findings, there are specific areas I would promote as instrumental in terms of restarting a process that for some reason stalled many years ago. And here are my three cents for the discussion. Firstly, I would like to move the responsibility for gender mainstreaming directly to the leadership of all levels. A gender advisor cannot be a comforting alibi or used as a watchdog for half-hearted efforts to appear politically correct. Gender mainstreaming in operation, operations is a leader's responsibility. It is a way of enhancing effectiveness of the organization and of an operation. Failing to recognize this means that you as a leader are not only failing to achieve equality, you are failing fundamentally as a leader in multiple aspects to include fairness, effectiveness, and basic human rights, to mention some. This means that change in the acts of leadership is long overdue. Secondly, I would like to emphasize that the proper way of auditing must be in place. In my opinion, we must be able to measure progression. Specific measurable goals on all levels of the organization must be in place, and the ambition must be clear, and the intent must be well known to all. Factors as gender distribution, knowledge, follow-up on gender challenges, inclusion of gender perspectives in all stages of planning, and execution of operations, as well as regular evaluation intervals, are all possible ways of motivating the entire organization to learn how to capitalize on gender mainstreaming. Gender equality is not a favor to women or a zero-sum game. It is benefiting all and a tool for effectiveness. Lastly, this is a joint effort in terms of how my two previous points will be respected and in all seriousness, how they will benefit the entire alliance. In this respect, 
the goal, goals can be achieved through proper strategic engagement. The first being a unanimous engagement by all Alliance members through proper allocation of resources, will and leadership to NATO, as well as at home. The second strategic effort should be focused on interaction between the political and the military side of the Alliance. Political guidance must transition into actual plans, as I mentioned before. Mutual respect and an effort to understand the differences between political and military culture is imperative. My next point may be a little controversial, but I still like it to be noted. I'm sure that cultural differences can be mitigated, as military culture oftentimes is misinterpreted as gender biased. Fortunately, this is not always the case. Another dear former colleague of mine, Nina Rones, has conducted her doctoral thesis on the modern armed forces culture. And her conclusion is simply that uh, the culture of the armed forces is distinct feminine by nature. Here, here. And NATO, as a value-based organization, should reach for its overarching goal, securing peace. And this task is so important that it cannot be left alone to be handled by one gender perspective only. As a concluding remark, I challenge this alliance to recognize this anniversary, not only as a celebration, but also as a perfect occasion to remind ourselves that the job is not even halfway done and that we still have an obligation to see this through, not only for our predecessors, but mainly for our children and for lasting peace. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes, my microphone went off. So, thank you very much for these three presentations. So, I believe that you each highlighted different aspects and that gives us the complete picture that we need in order to have a comprehensive and meaningful discussion here. Now, on my speakers list and Ruxandra, maybe you could confirm this. I have our uh, friend Raza, is that right? Former president of the NATO Parliamentary Assembly. Yeah. Raza, we can see you. Okay. Ah, hello. Yes, and you can hear me now? <laughs> yes. Hello. You have the hello. floor. I am so happy. I am so happy to see you, Ula and Roxandra, my good friends. I am missing you, by the way, uh, on, in my, on my new cap cap capabilities. <laughs> and also was was very very nice to be invited. Um, as you understand, we speak from from our houses, from home, as well as many others. Uh, so. Uh, not easy times, but uh, I would like to say some words on achievements uh, because it's, I have something to say. You introduced myself as uh, first uh, woman uh, in, uh, in, in the position of NATO, president of uh, NATO Parliamentary Assembly, despite that it was a very short period, but impressive, and uh, thank you for your support at that time. Uh, frankly speaking, uh, I never been very much involved very deeply into gender issues, uh, never even thought maybe myself that I am somehow different than other people or men. They, they take positions, other positions than, than women. Uh, but it, it happened somehow that uh, I also was able to uh, take position of Minister of Defense in Lithuania. 
and uh, of course, for me, it's important issues related with uh, with the women uh, positions and uh, women themselves, uh, their lives, and uh, how everything is going around. So uh, this time, I would like my intervention will be very short, and I would like uh, to speaking about achievements to underline that uh, we in European Parliament, uh, gender equality is very high on agenda, very high on agenda. So in both uh, sides, left, uh, right, center, wings, and in my political group, the European People Party political group, uh, we also um, are following uh, very, very much these, uh, this, this very important issue. And look, uh, our uh, first time in the history, uh, woman Ursula von der Leyen, he she became a, a commissioner president of the commission, and now in uh, European Commission we have 50 50 50 percent of women commissioners and 50 percent of men commissioners. And I am happy that uh, this uh, we managed to do this together with the other groups, and it was not easy, but we have very good uh, uh, commissioners, uh, both sides, men and women. I would not, I would not like to somehow uh, to, 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 to see who is uh, better or who is worse. But today also I would like to, uh, I am speaking just a few days after the election in Lithuania, general election in Lithuania. You know, all post-Soviet countries, I hate this name, but those countries, um, we were not able to live in democracy like Norway, Germany or France or other countries or the United States. Mm, of course, our natural life uh, historically was interrupted, and we started to build our democracy since 1990. Today, we have uh, three leaders of three political parties. They are forming, they are working on new coalition, on new government, and all three leaders of all three center-right political parties are women. Young, brilliant, very nice, educated woman, and this very new in Lithuania. You know, to see on the screens, on TV screens, three ladies together discussing on the future of Lithuania and a future government and prime minister. Future prime minister also will be a lady in Lithuania. But the most important, what I would like to say and bring your draw your attention, and I will finalize my intervention. I would like to draw your attention on Belarus. It's something unbelievable happened in this country with the so brutal dictatorship, where mainly, not only women, of course, men and women, they took responsibility to uh, find the new road towards democracy, new free and fair election, but women are leading there. And women did really something unbelievable, unbelievable, unprecedented in this country, in this particular country. So uh, I... Most important, I think, uh, for us, for women, uh, to to have uh, situations as I had, for example, and other women can have. It's of course historical um, traditions. Of course, society. Most important, our societies, where they are accepting or not women in one or another position, in military especially, or other other positions. Media, of course, and of course, best examples to follow. So now having you uh, with the European Commission uh, led by women, having other countries. Mm, so I have I have a lot of optimism. Uh, for the future, and I also would like to admit that Ruxandra Popa also first time she became Secretary General as Women Secretary General in NATO PA. It's it's first time, and I think she is doing very well. And uh, we all of us we will do very well to have uh, to bring better uh, how to say to open more wider the gates for young generation for young uh, women to be empowered. Uh, only problem maybe is that in 10 years or 20 years, we will speak about uh, maybe 
men uh, empowering <laughs> maybe per situation and of course gender equality is important for both sides of course i am i am convinced in that without strong men i would never become uh, minister of defense because behind me was uh, prime minister was uh, leader of my party they encourage it's very important to encourage both sides to take responsibilities and thank you so much good luck and really happy to be back with the, my good friends dankeschön dankeschön und uh, vielleicht ist der thank you I suppose that you only had these strong men um, as long as you were in their sight. You, I, our next speaker would be, would be our president, and I would like to give not only the floor, but also the moderation to our president. And then I have Galina Mihailiuk on our speakers list and um, this maybe gives Attila the opportunity to prepare himself to take over and then I would like to ask some questions. Attila, welcome. Thank you very much, sorry for the delay but today I had a meeting with the Speaker of the House and the Japanese Ambassador of international uh, programs and it was very busy and longer than I, I was expected so sorry for, for this delay but I know that uh, you, you you did better without me I guess so thank you very much I don't want to uh, take too much time uh, I think I just want to give a signal that uh, this uh, program this project is very important for NATO PA uh, no matter who leads uh, the NATO PA, because now uh, you know the situation is worse now because it's a man who is leading the uh, the NATO PA, and before it was a, a great woman. So, but I try to do my best. Uh, so that's why I wanted to be here and with my pre uh, personal presence, just show that 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 path that uh, uh, you know was started before it's it's still uh, a priority. So thank you very much for Ula. To, to helping me out uh, uh, during this uh, this uh, meeting. And now I, I would like to uh, ask you to go on, and I, of course, uh, I will be an observant, and I will chair the meeting. So, Ruxanda, please tell me, Rula, who is the next uh, who, who will speak? Please give me some information about that. So it is indeed, as, uh, as Rula was saying, Galina Mihalchuk uh, from Ukraine. Galina will get you on screen. Great, thank you. Dear ladies and gents, it's my pleasure uh, to have my small intervention on the topic. Uh, do you hear me well? Do you see me well? Is it fine? The connection is fine? Yeah, thank you. Um, so, as you know, I'm a, a member of the Parliament of Ukraine. I just wanted to make a small feedback regarding the Christina Finch intervention on Ukraine and how is it going now in the Parliament of Ukraine and Cabinet of Ministers of Ukraine regarding the gender quotas and uh, uh, gender balance. Uh, basically, the last parliamentary elections uh, of 2019 uh, resulted that we have 23% uh, of uh, female representatives in the parliament and this is uh, uh, the highest uh, um, rate uh, of uh, ladies being representative uh, being represented in the parliament um, just last sunday we had uh, local elections uh, uh, the results are now being processed uh, by the central election commission but the rule was that two out, out of five candidates uh, um, should be female representatives in the list uh, uh, that were approved by uh, um, in the list of candidates uh, uh, to the elections. Um, um, actually, uh, also last year, we had uh, changes to the standards of written language where feminists were represented uh, and nowadays it's officially uh, that Ukrainian language uh, is going to have uh, new endings which will be female based like uh, like we have in German uh, also some endings that for example the same will be introduced uh, um, in Ukrainian language uh, 
Although we have these new developments in terms of legislation that some uh, gender-based minimal quotas were introduced last year, the reality is now that uh, uh, current cabinet of ministers of Ukraine has only three female representatives. So this is right, 10%. One minister, one uh, vice prime minister, and one uh, acting minister. Unfortunately, we think that it's not enough, uh, uh, that the 10% in the cabin is still uh, um, not the best uh, uh, possible solution of being uh, represented in the cabinet of ministers. Uh, in the parliament of Ukraine, we have only two heads of the committees uh, being female out of uh, 23 committees. Uh, one from the mono-majority fraction and one from opposition fraction. All others are headed uh, by male representatives. And uh, but a number of uh, um, ladies, they deputize, of course, uh, um, the heads of the committees. Uh, from my personal experience, for example, um, last year I uh, was uh, one of the nominees uh, to be the head of um, International Relations Committee of the Parliament of Ukraine, and uh, I won uh, uh, the primaries to this uh, uh, position in my fraction. But uh, I know that the desired candidate was male 40 plus, and I happened to be female 30 plus. So basically, nonetheless, that I won the primaries, uh, male 40 plus got the position actually as a result. Uh, and everyone knew this, and uh, um, no one could, uh, let's say, uh, e explain why this happened. Uh, but that was kind of unofficial uh, um, explanation. Uh, I'm now deputy head of the law enforcement committee, and uh, a previous convocation of the Parliament of Ukraine happened to have zero females in the law enforcement committee. So I am the first ever female ever be who has ever been selected to the law enforcement committee as a deputy head. And every time when I have different different meetings with other colleagues from from other fractions from other committees, every time they mention that I'm uh, how can I survive in the this law enforcement male environment uh, being the female, but um, actually I'm proud to be uh, uh, part of my committee. And uh, um, as my head of my committee tells me that uh, my presence in the committee changed a lot the climate uh, uh, in the committee itself. Uh, I would like also to say that uh, um, it seems that there is still room for improvement even in terms of uh, uh, parliamentary quotas, in terms of uh, uh, who won the positions in the parliament. Of course, we should, uh, as Christina Finch mentioned, that uh, uh, we should be an example to follow uh, for all other institutions uh, uh, and bodies. Uh, but again, uh, myself and even my colleagues, I hope that this meeting is off the record, we feel that there is still um, uh, much higher chances to get the highest position uh, uh, if you are male 40 plus. This is kind of our phrase that uh, you will be successful anyway if you, you if you are within this quarter. Uh, that's why uh, I think that uh, uh, let's say sometimes we uh, females um, female uh, um, members of the parliament we have even uh, registered a draft law that for the next parliamentary elections we want quotas to be not 40-60 as it is now but 50-50 and uh, whenever we have um, any kind of discussions on some draft laws this is kind of our uh, our threat to all the male representatives of the parliament that we will put this draft law in the plenary for the voting if uh, if, if, if they will not uh, behave uh, so that well Still, um, the situation now, I think, is much better than it was um, uh, before previous parliamentary elections because previous parliament had uh, uh, less than 20 percent, like uh, 15, 18 percent of uh, female representatives in the parliament. Uh, now it's much more. Uh, but uh, again, uh, if we talk about the general amount uh, uh, of uh, people uh, and Again, if you want to deputize any position, that's fine. But unfortunately, there are some issues uh, if you would like to lead um, um, either ministry 
or um, um, or to be the head of the committee or to be the head of other structural bodies. And uh, actually, we have a great hope for international partners uh, who will uh, can maybe kindly remind every time uh, on all the levels uh, uh, when uh, we have different uh, interactions and negotiations about gender quotas, about representation, uh, female representation, uh, um, at all the levels on the positions, uh, and uh, um, hopefully that uh, we will succeed for the best. Thank you. That was kind of my feedback, how it is now. Uh, and uh, I hope uh, that was interesting and useful for you. Thank you. Thank you very much. And now I would like to ask the speakers to answer, I guess. No, Ula, Ula. Yeah, you have, you have a question. So you add your question to the former ones. Okay, sorry. Sorry, Ula. Please. Yes, please. If I could ask questions for our three speakers. First of all, my first question, I would like to address it to Claire. You said that at present, two things, two aspects are new challenges for us. First of all, populism, right-wing populism, um, which has a very negative uh, repercussion also on women's rights. And this means that not only in our member states, but also inside NATO, we have to make sure that gender mainstreaming and the and equal rights for women and men are an integral part, for example, of training for leadership personnel. So my question would be, in this reflection process, NATO 2030, uh, does this subject also, is it, is it part of this reflection process? And if so, uh, how can you deal with these questions within this reflection process? Second question is a question directed to Louise. I appreciate very much when you said that those who are unable to have a gender uh, e equal um, and then we call missions, they cannot be good commanders either, because it's not the question whether women are better people, better human beings, but it is a question of fundamental values and values of our democracy. Um, that with, in NATO, we also have within our values the equality of men and women, and we have to implement these values. So my question would be, what can we still do? What could be better in national parliaments? Uh, what can we do for our national armed forces? And when it comes to training of leadership personnel, are these questions also taken into account in training of leadership personnel? And one last question to Louise, no, to Christina. What was her name? Christina. Christina, I'm very sorry. You talked about budgets and funding for these questions. We in our committee, we also discussed the repercussions of the pandemic. And there is a certain danger that certain resources from national uh, budgets are used especially for health system, for uh, the economy, and that in the end we will have sort of a rollback effect in uh, gender questions because of this. So what would be, uh, what, what is your experience with countries you work with? Is there a difference in their attitude and their stance because of the COVID-19 pandemics? Do women lose uh, their uh, employments? Is there less education for women? And what about the national budgets for these issues? Thank you very much. Please. I, I I didn't quite quite catch up, but I think I'm not I expected to answer right now. Um, so uh, thank you for that question, and it's a, a, a very important question because one of the 
one of what we know is that then when gains are fought hard for, including rights, they can easily be lost if it's not a continuous push to keep them on the agenda. And, and this goes for women, peace and security and gender, uh, women's rights, the whole range. And that the only way to have a substantial connection so that any gains, any rights won cannot be lost is by making sure it's integrated and it's sustainable in policies and legislation and constitutional reform to make sure it belongs and it will not move. And so uh, this is beyond training. And as you rightly hi highlighted, it's a, also about, but not only about leadership. And the idea of a top-down approach and, and a NATO, with our NATO military authorities, we call it top-down, bottom-up, where it meets in the middle because it has to be the responsibility of everybody. And this is uh, why the Secretary General in his 2030 process, in his uh, review process, um, has put women, peace and security and human security. Um, and let me explain that very briefly, that in NATO, uh, women, peace and security exist side by side with the human security approach, which means that we bring a gender perspective into all of the work that we do, which is a bridge between military and political by looking at protection, civilians, uh, children armed conflict, cultural property, human trafficking. Uh, uh, and, and what we call the human security element of the work that we do. And uh, 2030 has that very much at its core. Uh, not only did the Secretary General insist on it being the, the, the composition of the panel be gender balanced, which it is, but that this is part of the way we are going to look at the future of NATO. And very often it has been the Secretary General and Deputy Secretary General, as well as all our leadership, have talked about the 2030 process being infused with gender, um, that it is part of it. And it is essential for it to be so, because as we move forward, we cannot leave this behind. Uh, this is a core a value, but it's also an essential, essential operationally, as well as strategically and politically. And so we cannot reframe the way we look at the work we do. We cannot vision the future of NATO without looking at women, peace and security as an incredi incredibly important but essential, critical element of the way we will do our business in the future. Thank you. Who is the next? Vice Admiral or, or Christina? Please, go on. Yeah, yeah Admiral, your, sorry, your microphone is off. Let me see uh, if we can turn it on our side. doesn't seem to fix the problem. Can you see it on your side, uh, maybe? Try again, the, the bottom at the, no, at the bottom of your screen. Okay, I'm, yeah, I'm really sorry. This doesn't seem to be working. <clears throat> Um, maybe, Mr. President, we can we can try uh, Christina while while we try to fix. Um... Of course, yeah, of course, of course. Christina, please. Can you hear me? Excellent. Uh, <laughs> so, first of all, uh, to uh, the honourable member from Ukraine, uh, thank you very much for uh, your intervention and the additional information about uh, women, peace, and security. Uh, and women's role in parliaments in Ukraine. Uh, I mentioned Ukraine as an example and the work that we're doing there. It takes courage and political will for a country to open itself up to self-scrutiny. Uh, so we're, we're very proud of our relationship with Ukraine and the work that we've been doing with security institutions in country. Um, turning to... Uh, the question regarding the pandemic, which has affected quite literally all of us globally, no less so women. The pandemic absolutely has gendered effects that we've seen. And we're only, uh, we're less than a year by some accounts into it, but uh, we've already seen data that have shown incidents of domestic violence 
have increased due to the pandemic. Women are disproportionately affected by domestic violence. Women have increased caregiving, uh, caregiving responsibilities quite often and increased job losses quite often connected with those responsibilities around caregiving. Um, some of the data coming, for example, out of the United States is staggering in terms of the disproportionate effect on women and job loss due to the pandemic. So what I would say is these are all part of the women in peace and security broad agenda. These are all security issues. So there can be no rollback in terms of budgeting around implementing the women, peace and security agenda around supporting women uh, and that the, the effects of the pandemic have and will continue to touch every aspect of this agenda in terms of effects and conflicts in fragile states, uh, in terms of, of migration, in terms of disproportionate effects on women. So it should not be seen as an either or but rather as something that is integral to uh, continuing to push the agenda and push for recovery once the, the pandemic is hopefully behind us. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. And now the Vice Admiral, Luis, can you? Yeah. Let's try it. Now, and if it doesn't yeah. work, maybe try refreshing uh, your screen again and see if that can solve the problem. You will get disconnected and need to request the, the floor again, but at least it might fix the sound problem. Uh, I'll let you know, Mr. President, as soon as she uh, she's back. Let's try again. Looks good. Yes. Yeah. Excellent. Excellent. Perfect. With both sound and picture, that's very good. Thank you so much again for your uh, very important question. Um, uh, and who am I to <laughs> to challenge parliamentarians? Um, anyway, I think that well, I'm always been a great believer in in numbers, uh, meaning that. Parliamentary, uh, parliamentarians can always challenge governments through legislation and budget approvals uh, by asking for concrete actions and evidence for success. And as mentioned by DCAF, uh, the uh, surveys that were conducted, those are not only impressive, but also essential. So I think that those are extremely good tools. And this also goes for the um, military side, I have to say. So um, whenever we find something to be extremely important, we allocate budget for, the, for that purpose. And that is possible for every level in the military structure to allocate numbers, uh, allocate funds to, to obtain certain, uh, certain goals. So um, first of all, to, to um, decide on the... Um, numerical goals and then ask for uh, for results that's my um, my best answer i hope i answered it and also i would like to to commend claire for her uh, very very good answers on her question thank you thank you very much so now we can go on with the questions if i'm right uh, the next uh, we will collect three questions all together uh, the next one is uh, Noara Jaffer from Algeria, and then uh, from Sweden, Alexander Fölker. Uh, so, Mrs. Jaffer, we should have you on screen. Let's see if it works. Yep. Je devrais intervenir. Ça sera pas une question. Thank you. I'd like to, um, it's not a question, but um, more a, uh, a comment on women, peace and security. So, ladies and gentlemen, chairman, uh, good evening or good afternoon. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank the uh, Parliamentary Assembly for this uh, initiative. Um, which aims to strengthen the principle that 
women and men are equal partners in the quest for peace and security. The world is uh, faced with uh, major challenges nowadays uh, because of instability in, in uh, many regions caused by uh, conflicts, wars, and uh, economic, social, and security crises that have a, a negative influence, a tragic influence on the reality of women and girls because of their exposure to various types of violence, whether it be uh, physical, uh, psychological, social, or sexual. This situation is uh, worsening uh, as the uh, international community is putting the emphasis on the respect of human rights and considers women's rights as one of the fundamental aspect of these rights and is working to the towards the implementation of good governance through the contribution of uh, all citizens whether men or women without any discrimination it's um, a role uh, on which uh, the uh, charters treaties and international agreements insist on uh, all these agreements uh, that are dealing with uh, the fight against discrimination and so the international community has committed to uh, attain these goals. Algeria, which uh, adopted the resolution 1325 from the UN Security Council and uh, the uh, associated resolutions, um, has uh, suffered uh, terrorist attacks during the um, Black Decade, which have undermined peace and stability. However, Thanks to the uh, political will and the uh, efforts that were uh, made by the by Algerians, Algeria was able to overcome this uh, the, these difficulties, and Algerian women contributed to the success of the national reconciliation because they uh, they uh, contributed a lot of efforts alongside men to the attainment of these uh, objectives, and so. The principle of the uh, of women's participation in the political process through the uh, increasing uh, its representation in the elected assemblies has given rise to the uh, adoption of an organic law based on the principle of quotas in all the um, candidates' list in all elections, and so this. Uh, allowed Algeria to join the club of countries that have reached the objective in the uh, Beijing um, action plan, namely 30% 30% of uh, decision positions allocated to women. And there are a number of mechanisms that are strengthening the position of women. For example, the um, criminal code that was uh, modified, that was amended, and that includes now um, clauses that uh, criminalizes violence in all its forms, including uh, sexual harassment, in order to protect women and children. This policy, which is based on the gender dimension, has been implemented thanks to a, a global multi-sectoral uh, strategy uh, through a, uh, inter sectoral programs that um, are aimed at fighting discrimination based on, on gender. And so this strategy is monitored and assessed by the parliamentarians. Ladies and gentlemen, Algeria in Africa is fully committed to uh, peace and security in order to protect women by involving them in the process of conflict resolution and peacekeeping. In December 2017, Algeria has um, organized the first General Assembly of the uh, Pan-African Network of Mediator Women. This, uh, there was a uh, heads of state and government of Africa who uh, uh, who uh, attended, and it was created to institutionalize the role of women in uh, peace negotiations. Also in the Arab League, Algeria has always worked for the promotion of women and the uh, strengthening of its um, position. And in 2019, Algeria chaired the 38th Commission of uh, on uh, uh, Arab Women, which uh, in, uh, 
organized a, a committee for the protection of women in armed conflict and has also allowed the creation of an institution uh, dedicated to peace. And Algeria is calling for the implementation of Resolution 1325 uh, on the continent level and also at the international level and has organized a symposium to exchange best practices which is essential which are essential to improve uh, things on the national and international level and the UN Security Council has adopted the uh, resolution 1325 unanimously in uh, 2000 recognizing the disproportionate impact that conflicts have on women and girls and it allowed them to move from the status of victims to uh, participants working to the uh, to peacekeeping and peace consolidation. However, violence against women during uh, armed conflicts is still the most uh, abject uh, form of violence. And so we have to remember that the efforts that were made to uh, uh, restore peace have been successful in, in here and there. However, um, for a number of reasons uh, quoted in the report, it is unfortunate that the the realization of the measures that were uh, mentioned in Resolution 1325 are beyond the ambitions and the, the wishes that were expressed. And so we cannot be satisfied with the results that we've had so far. After 20 years of, of, uh, of efforts, we, have, we are called to make a substantial assessment of the work that was accomplished and to define clearly all the obstacles and challenges that uh, are hindering the realization of all the objectives based on the reality on the ground. And I, uh, to conclude, uh, I have to mention the um, unprecedented challenges that we are facing today because of the uh, spreading of the uh, COVID-19 pandemic. It is a, a pandemic that has impacted negatively the whole world. And we are feeling the, uh, the repercussions. And so it can only complicate the situation of uh, women situation which is already uh, complicated and, and the situation of vulnerable women and girls in the world. And so the international community is called to adopt new methods to uh, to, uh, to mitigate the um, damages that are, that, that are caused by this pandemic and International solidarity is important in order to uh, make sure that everyone can live in a situation where there is peace, stability, and security. Thank you for listening. Um, merci, Madame Jafar. Uh, I believe we lost the president, but he had already announced that the next speaker was going to be Alexandra Volker uh, from Sweden. So I'd like to give her the floor. Okay, thank you. I hope you all can hear me. Uh, this is the first time that I'm using Kudo, actually, so <laughs> that was uh, very interesting. Thank you for a very interesting seminar and for um, uh, all of your, your thoughts and experiences. It was very interesting to, to hear from all of you. Uh, this is a uh, very important uh, issue and, and, and I think, I hope that we will talk much more about this when it, uh, in and in NATO, NATO Parliamentary Assembly in general, and also at the, at the larger um, summits, because this is a very important issue. I wanted to to talk especially about the role of the parliament, which was lifted especially by the admiral, which I think is so important, um, and the important role that, that we as, um, as parliamentarians and in our committees have when it comes to these um, issues. Um, in Sweden, uh, which I'm representing, we have since 2014 uh, had um, implemented a feminist foreign policy agenda, which means that in everything that we do when it comes to, to foreign policy, we see the, the uh, especially exposed role of women and children. We see the 
the need to especially address women, uh, both when it comes to foreign aid uh, projects, but also when it comes to foreign policy in general. Uh, and we can also see, which is also when we come back to, to politics and uh, the, the parliaments, that if we actually want more women in to take part of military missions, to take part of peace negotiations, um, then we actually have to do the, the work beforehand because they won't just be there. <laughs> and we need to have women to have the right um, experience, the right education, the right uh, training. Um, and that won't happen by itself. We need to to take political decisions that actually will, will point on that, that says that we need these projects, we need these education projects, we need to especially try to recruit women to the military, for example, or we need to have um, female leaders being um, educated when it comes to peace negotiations and uh, to actually pinpoint women that we can see will have an important role in their community when it comes to peace negotiations. And uh, so in that sense, I think it's uh, so important what you talked about, what, what important role that we as politicians um, have. And I think that, um, well, in Sweden, I think we have come uh, a bit on the way when it comes to foreign policy, but I think we we still have a, a way to go when it comes to, to defense polit policy in general. I think it's it's easier when talking about uh, foreign policy in general than if, when talking about defense specifically, since it's... Um, it has been historically so so male dominated, but we are trying to do our best here as well. And I think here as well, it's so important with um, with, um, with pol uh, political leadership that actually really shows that this is the way that we have to go. And I'm very happy that we have since just a few years ago actually have uh, restarted subscription, and this time it's actually uh, non. non not depending on your gender, it's it's the same for everyone. So I think that was will hopefully be an important step on the way. Um, but um, yes, so so very thank you for this, and I think it's been some very interesting points, both when it comes to to the role of politics, but also the role of auditing. I've been kind of uh, scared sometimes when it comes to international military missions when we don't even know how many women that take place in the in the mission uh, even though that's one of the UN goals uh, we don't even really know how many how large part of the, the military part is actually um, um, uh, how many women are taking place in the military part which makes it imp impossible to know if we are even close to reaching our target so thank you very much uh, and I'm looking forward to hear the rest of the discussion uh, thank you. And uh, the president is having technical issues. He's uh, trying to rejoin uh, our meeting. Uh, and so under Ula's authority, if you don't mind, Ula, I'll give the floor next to Anna Bonfrisco from the European Parliament. Let's try again. We're trying to get her on screen. Let's see. Yeah, it's looking good. Okay. Yeah. Oui. <laughs> Thank you. Just a moment, please. So just the camera the camera is not pointed, I think, in the right direction, but we can hear you. Thank you. We can hear you. So, if you would like to ask your question, um, yeah, don't don't hesitate to start. The camera settings doesn't work. No, but we can we can hear you. So, if you would like to ask your question, then then uh, the speakers can can certainly hear you. Okay. Okay. <laughs> thank you, Mr. President, and thank you, colleagues. This is a very important debate. I'm proud to be able to share with you some words. The Security Council resolution on women, peace and security is meant to protect women and girls. 
I will go straight to the point. There is still a lack of gender perspective in security policy. We ask to algorithm and AI to include gender perspective. Therefore, we have to fully incorporate gender perspective in our society. The solution is inspirational, but we need to get gender perspective and gender balance done. And the civil society today is powerful and could help. Of course, on the ground, we are still dealing with a majority of very conservative or extremist and fundamentalist governments. Their ethics reject inclusivity and pluralism. No women participation in the intra-Afghan dialogue in Doha. No women in the Libya talk in Urgada. I denounce the educational and cultural poverty of many societies. Why should a young woman undergo a virginity test? Why forcing a woman into a marriage? Why does a woman have to fight for her sexual rights? But my final consideration is also on the bright side of women's achievements. Kate Ruby is now on the International Space Station and is the first human to have sequenced DNA in space. Emmanuel Cherpentier and Jennifer Dudna, Nobel laureates in chemistry for inventing the genetic scissor and bringing life sciences into a new era for the benefit of all humanity. Thank you, colleagues. Thank you. And uh, OK, our president is back. So let's try. Mr. President. With my phone, because my, my <laughs> that's the, I don't know why, but the, the laptop doesn't work or with the laptop. So it's a little bit more difficult. Yeah, and now uh, a Swedish colleague uh, has a question. So that's, right. that's done. Uh, we oh, did okay, also, sorry. Yep, that's fine. Uh, we did the European Parliament, and we have one last question, if you would like to group Yeah, everyone. of course, please, please do that. Please, thank Okay, you so uh, Emmanuel Jacob, who's the president of uh, Euromil, uh, the European Organization of Military Associations. Uh, Emmanuel. Thank you. Um, you can hear me, you can see me. Um, first of all, I want to thank the, the NATO Parliamentary Assembly for um, inviting us for this important event and for this discussion. Uh, I surely want to thank you for giving us as an observer the opportunity to take the floor and ask a question. Um, in a matter of fact, it's, it's even more a question, it's more a remark that I want to make. Um, when I look to our organization, as, as said, um, an organization of military associations and military trade unions from Europe with 33 organizations from 21 European countries. And when I look to our organizations, um, I have unfortunately to say that we only have three which are led by uh, women. And of these three, only two are professional soldiers. Um, when we look around in Europe, um, then we almost have no female organizations. Now, I'm not calling to have only women organizations or women professional organizations or unions, um, but there, there exists only one for the moment as far as we know. And this organization had even to open at a certain moment its membership for colleagues, female soldiers. And that was also the proof in that country, it was in Bulgaria, um, that a female organization were the ones who could protect all soldiers. Now, uh, when we have meetings with our organizations or when I visit them abroad, um, we hardly ever met uh, female delegates. And when we discuss them anyway with female soldiers or with those representing the associations or the unions, always the same arguments are coming back. The problem of um, not having the chance to deal with things 
um, having two lives, the professional life and the family life to take care of, not have the proper framework in the barracks to deal with things. And so I think that, that what we would like to do is, is not only to call to military leadership to give possibilities to their female soldiers to have the, the proper train, train um, framework, sorry, um, to, to work in these kinds of associations, to represent military personnel, or to make sure that all military personnel, men and women, are represented. But I would also like to call on parliaments, on parliaments to deal with these kinds of things. Um, therefore, it's very good to have this kind of discussion on the level of the NATO Parliamentary Assembly. But I would say to national parliamentarians, after this, you are back in your national parliament, and there you should reopen the debate. Because it, it's very good to have on our level here in NATO Parliamentary Assembly this discussion, but you should take it back home and reopen the debate. It's so important. Everybody is convinced that we have uh, women in the armed forces for the moment, that um, our women are in missions abroad and they have their very important role to play. I'm convinced that we need this also in representing military personnel. Um, we need to represent everybody, by everybody, but everybody needs to have the, the, the same opportunities to take care of that and to deal with it. And so this is something that parliamentary uh, members of parliament can organize because they make the legal framework to deal with it. And then it's up to military leadership to um, organize it and to deal with it. But once again, thank you very much, NATO PA, for organizing the debate and opening this discussion. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you very much, Emmanuel. And now uh, there's another question from, from a Turkish uh, colleague. So please be patient a little bit. And now we take the last question from our Turkish uh, colleague. Yes, please. Uh, Ruxandra helped me to put her on the screen. I think she's disappeared really? from the request list. Wow. So Zera, if you still want to request the floor, uh, you have to click the button again. So we bring you on screen. Uh, if not, we'll... we'll we can go to the answers, maybe. So she has, yeah, she has disappeared from our list uh, right now. Okay, then let's go on with the with the answers and uh, and the concluding the uh, the meeting. Thank you. Who would Claire, like do you to want start? To start again? Yeah. yeah. Who is the first answer? Yeah. I think it's me. Um, so I just want to yeah, I want to pick up on a, on a on a few points actually that were raised and and one especially on um, on feminist foreign policy and the ability to have a defence feminist policy, which I think absolutely. Why don't we have feminist defence policies? Because feminism is about equality, and we're looking at equality in our national forces. And the idea of driving equality, uh, be it through diversity, but also be it through all of the policies that we would infuse with gender, is exactly where we want to be. And that is something that we should be encouraging. All posts, all jobs in all military should be open for women, uh, equally to men. All training opportunities need to be offered to women equally to men. Um, it is women's decision on where they want to do or take their careers, but the idea that we should have open and accessibility to women, um, and that shouldn't be designed as an obstacle in any institution, uh, I think is part of the future and where we need to take 2020. And I will just uh, want to uh, pick up on something about questions, uh, how we how we change structures. Um, and it always is, is interesting for me to hear about obstacles are put in way by saying, well, women have family lives. Well, so do men. Um, and men also have children. And we have uh, hu humanity 
who have equal responsibility, or and if they don't, they should have, because men have children and should also take care of them. So the idea we're putting obstacles in the way to say, well, women have a particular responsibility is not what we should be talking about in 2020, um, and using that as obstacles for challenges for women, whether it be in defense forces or whether it be on a political career or whether it be whether you want to just work in the local shop. Um, it is about how we change the conversation about equality. And when I used to work in peacekeeping, many times they would have conversations where they would often ask the men to respond what the challenges to women were. And it used to come up, well, women don't want to deploy because they don't want to leave their children behind. But when you ask women, that was not the answer. And so we have to drive policy forward by asking the same questions to different people, to different sections of our society, so we can come up with a robust answer. Um, and as we move forward, looking at the next 10, 20, however, however many years, we want to make sure that our defense conversations, our foreign policy conversations, they are all driven by the feminist perspective of equality. And that should be where we start, and that should be the beginning of the conversation, but not the end of it. Thank you, Emma. And now, who is the next? Uh, Admiral, let's try. Yeah, it's it was looking good. Yeah, I, I, yeah. yeah. super. Um, thank you again, and I think that there were some uh, very impressive comments that were made, um, especially from. Um, to hear from Algeria and quotas on all lists, that was very impressive. And also, as also Claire mentioned, the feminist foreign policy agenda from Sweden, very impressive and very inspiring. Um, and also uh, from the uh, representative from the European Parliament to use I, A, uh, A, AI to include gender, that's a very good idea. Uh, I also agree with Claire on the um, uh, excuse that is, you know, referred to when it comes to the difficulty for women to deploy or to um, to volunteer for this or that because of having a family. But then again, I have to remind us of the fact that there are a lot of stigma around. So it's not all, always easy, you know, to be that mom to defend yourself because you're doing this or that, uh, and you get tired of it uh, after a while. Um, also, um, I have to, you probably know, but uh, compulsory military service in Norway, in my country, has been um, for both men and women ever since 2015. And we see so, so beautiful effects of that because recruitment is going up. And of course, women in the military also slowly but at least it goes in the right direction. That is very that is a very good thing. But when it comes to the whole question uh, on women, peace and security, it's always also a question about education. It's always a question about dialogue. It's always a question about networking, and it's uh, always a question of uh, using you know the right tools. And I've always been a great believer in mentoring. Um, because, I mean, nobody, um, I've, I've never heard about anybody who, uh, who lost their status because of, they, because of passing on good advice to, uh, to other people. So I'd share for that. Thank you. And Christina. Yes, thank you. I can only agree with my panelists uh, on their comments. And also to add, in terms of barriers to uh, women in peacekeeping forces, I would mention one project DCAP's very proud to be a part of uh, the Canadian LC project. So we are actually working with them to examine barriers in, uh, for women in peacekeeping forces. 
what are the perceptions around women as caregivers? What are the realities around whether that stops them uh, or has, it throws up a barrier for them to being a part of a peacekeeping force? So realities, perceptions, and how to overcome those biases uh, in terms of actual policies and perceptions are, uh, is, is the project that we're very proud to be a part of. I would also add um, maybe one final thought in terms of the women, peace and security agenda is a groundbreaking agenda. But to implement such a groundbreaking agenda, transformational action is needed. Numbers are critical, absolutely critical, but it goes beyond that. And, that, and this is really where I want to highlight the role of parliaments. Transformational action requires political will. It requires self-scrutiny. It requires institutional ownership. And it requires lasting change. Parliaments have a role to play in each of these, in creating the political will, pushing for institutional change, helping to provide local ownership, and making sure that these changes actually transform the way security institutions do their work and view men and women and taking place within that work. I'll leave it there, but thank you very much for having me. Thank you very much. Uh, if I'm right, every every uh, question uh, questions were answered. So I think we are a little bit uh, run out of uh, time. So thank you very much for the interpreters for their work and, and patience. And thank you very much uh, for our guests to, to speak about this uh, very important issue. And I would like to inform you and uh, all uh, uh, members that we will go on with this discussion and dialogue. So we will have some opportunities in the Civil Dimension uh, Committee uh, in the NATO PA. But of course, at the annual session, we will have some space and time to, to discuss all these issues. So thank you very much again for your time and uh, for your knowledge that you just shared uh, with us. Uh, I would like to declare uh, this meeting closed. Thank you very much. Thank you very much again.